Hi, we're here. Right, so welcome to another episode of our science adventures. I'm really excited for this one because it's it's a virus this week. It's it's Langley virus. So we're gonna go on a journey and check it out together. So let's have a look. This is so exciting. It's very, very rare that you that you get news like this. I say it's exciting for me because I'm a virologist by background. And whenever there's a viral outbreak, there's definitely a sense of, you know, holy crap, this is this is awesome. Uh, I'll see if I can just flip myself so I don't look like I'm talking to like the wall. <laughs> All right, what is Langue virus? Langue virus is particularly exciting for me because I did my PhD on a head of a virus. There's six of them, so they're not very common. They're pretty rare and they're really deadly, a lot of them. <laughs> so exciting. New virus, guys. Okay, so uh, I've tried to find the actual article from the New England Journal of Medicine, but even if I log into my work's uh, intranet through a VPN, it still doesn't recognize that I'm from a research institution. So unfortunately, I can't share the original article with you. I should have saved it while I was at work, but I didn't do that because I'm silly. All right, so the first sample was detected in late 2008. Okay, so it's not actually that new. And it's part of the Hennepovirus family. These are the two provinces. Oh, okay, so of the 35 patients, that came in, only 26 were found to be infected with only Lange virus, and it was predominantly detected in shrews. Here we go, this is the person that they interviewed, this guy called Francois Balou, a computational systems biology professor who was not involved in the study. I'm not quite sure why they've chosen to quote this person. I'm guessing, you know, he's on Twitter, he's a scientist, he's talking about this. They've just chosen not to, to take a tweet from an epidemiologist, and they've chosen to take a tweet from a computational biologist. I don't know why they do this, but they, they seem to because they just take the most clickbaity tweet or the tweet that just fits in best with what they want to say at the time, which is just yeah frustrating. But And another reason why researchers really don't like their work being disseminated to the media <laughs> or the general public a lot of the time in any form other than a paper because it tends to get like repackaged and given clickbait titles and it's it can be frustrating. So he's, he's come right out and said that it doesn't look like a repeat of COVID-19, which it's not because it doesn't... I don't think it has human to human transmission. There it is, probably doesn't transmit easily from human to human. So, you know, I'm not too worried. We're now in the age of pandemics. Can we stop the next one? Well, I actually did a piece on this for uni and it was talking about how we could do forest conservation and how many dollars if we invested in stopping deforestation, um, the amount of money that we would save uh, on treating pandemics just by simply preventing them from happening. Because when you have people living next door to forests, you have what we call spillover events, which is where the virus jumps from the animal population into the human population and causes disease. And if you just do basic level of preventing deforestation, you can actually stop most pandemics and save billions of dollars a year. I wonder if I can pull up the um, the thing I did because it's got all the actual numbers in there and they're just mind-blowing. We asked the scientists who helped discover Ebola, a Nobel laureate, and the man who first published COVID's genetic code. 1976, the virus hunters landed in the remote African village of Yambuku. Oh. But yeah, back to this virus. So it's been called Langia Hennepa virus. And I guess it's getting traction now, even though that it was first observed in 2018 because there's been a, an outbreak of it. And there's also been this paper that was published. It can cause respiratory symptoms such as fever, cough, and fatigue. And it's closely related to two other Hennepa viruses known to infect people, Hendra and Nipah. So the lab I used to work in did a lot of work on Hendra and Nipah virus. I personally studied Hendra virus. It's really, really cool. The way it works, it's, it's just such a unique virus and it's so incredibly conserved the way that it, it infects cells, the size of it, what its proteins do. It's viruses have evolved to be these like ultimate, really like just they have one task and they do it so well. They've evolved to cut out any unnecessary baggage or proteins or anything that they don't need just to be as small as possible, as efficient as possible. And Hennepin viruses are an awesome example of that because they're just, they're so small. So we'll talk about Hennepin viruses. They are negative strand RNA viruses, which means that they are like this, single stranded RNA viruses. And they're made of ribonucleic acid as opposed to deoxyribonucleic acid, which you'll know is DNA. And they act as complementary strands from which messenger RNA is synthesized. So we talked about this last week about how if you think about the cell as a house, the nucleus is the kitchen where you cook things or you make new parts of the house, I guess, or maybe it's the workshop. And then you have like the recipe book in there, which is your DNA. And you have to make sort of temporary carbon copies of your DNA, sort of write them down on a piece of paper. And that's your RNA and that gets taken out of the kitchen. 
Can we just go back to Hannibal virus for now? So it's in the family Paramoxiviridae and genus is Hannibal virus. This is so small. So when I was at uni doing honours, we had an electron microscope that we used to use for virology and, and visualising things. Whenever we would infect cells with viruses, we could actually go and image them um, if we asked very nicely because we were just, you know, scrappy little honours students. And the thing is huge. I mean, I'm pretty sure it was an electron microscope. Probably probably wasn't. It's probably like 10 times bigger than that. And me with my starry little, you know, honours kid, I was like, wow, an electron microscope. So Hennepoviruses are cool because they are well around where I'm from, Australia and Southeast Asia. We've got two of the big ones. Uh, we've got Hendra virus, which was discovered in Australia. It was discovered down the road from me in a suburb called Hendra in Brisbane. We've also got Nipah virus, which is um, throughout South, uh, Southeast Asia and occasionally gets a little bit too close for comfort for us. Pops up here and there. And they are pleomorphic, so they're variably shaped. So this is, the, this is the cool thing about them. Look at this. One, two, three, four, five, six proteins. And then from the P gene, you've got all of these, P, V, W, and C. And I was looking at the C protein specifically. The way that this gets these V, W, and C proteins is it has this thing called leaky translation, which is where the ribosome goes, tick -tick 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 -tick. the ribosome is the, it's a macromolecular machine, I guess. Yeah, it's the best way that can be described. It's a thing, it goes like this on your DNA and it goes, tick -tick 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 -tick, and it links amino acids together um, by reading the genetic code. And those long chains fold into proteins. There's four levels of protein structure, primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary. It's it's really cool what these guys do. So this ribosome comes along, and where did my lovely little picture go? It comes along this strand of messenger RNA. Well, actually, this will be a single, negative single strand, sense strand of RNA. Uh, and it comes along and it gets to the P and it goes, oh, and it stutters. And that stuttering allows it to do a sort of like a little hop or a skip on the DNA strand. And then it'll start reading from a different base pair. So if it's going like ATG, 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 if it gets to ATG and goes, oh, it does a little hiccup, it then doesn't go to the next A, it might go to the T or the G. It's probably the best way I could explain it. When that happens, it translates, it can translate three different proteins, which is really clever way that this virus has managed to condense more information into its genetic code and also just pack in more of a punch by keeping itself as small as possible. And I was investigating the C protein and I was looking at what triggers the leaky translation. Like why does that occur? When specifically does that occur? And also I was looking at the function of the C protein. And my strongest theory was that it was almost like a feedback mechanism. So when, you know, the leaky translation is happening, it's happening, you know, a certain amount of the time. And then, so a certain amount of the time you'll produce a C protein. And when that C protein reaches a certain threshold, then it triggers the virus to enter a late stage of exiting the cell and starting to uh, put processes in place. Like there's all these filaments and strands inside your cell. Those things coupling together, making holes in the surface of the cell, hijacking machinery to like transport things up there. Really, really cool. So I was trying to, my hypothesis was that the C protein was involved in virus exiting the cell and spreading. And I thought that a certain level of C protein would trigger that late stage of replication and hijacking of cellular machinery. Super, super cool. Let's just, let's just look up Ebola. There's several types of Ebola. We've got Ebola Zaire, Ebola Sudan, and we've got Ebola Restin. And Ebola Restin, when it was first discovered, people had it, they had samples of it, and they didn't know that it was Ebola. Thankfully, it's not airborne. I feel like if Ebola was airborne, the world would be a very different place. <laughs> Five scientists died of Ebola working on a single study on the virus. That's so sad. Actually, there was a, um, a scholarship in Melbourne called the Dora... I think it's the Dora Lush Scholarship, actually. How did I not, how did I not remember this earlier? I so say she died after she was trying to make a vaccine for the thing that she died from which was typhoid? Lethal scrub typhus. Isn't that incredible? The dedication scientists have to their stuff sometimes was just like, holy guacamole. Anyway, I think we might leave it there today, guys. Um, just a little quick one. Thanks for coming back and having another watch that onion. I will see you next week.